Okay, we're live. Well, thank you very much for joining our webinar this evening. Uh, it's another webinar in our 2021-22 series. And thank you for being with us on a number of these occasions. I'm Alistair Noble. I'm one of the directors of the Center for Intelligent Design in the UK. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce our president, Professor David Galloway, who is going to give tonight's presentation. The title of his presentation is Design Dissected. Is the design real? And the title is clearly related to David's distinguished career as a consultant surgeon based in the west of Scotland. And he is currently an honorary professor of surgery in the University uh, of, of Glasgow. Now, David graduated in medicine from the University of Glasgow and his postgraduate specialist clinical training has involved working in hospitals in Glasgow, in London and in New York City. His research work focused on different aspects of cancer, and in particular, he has investigated the influence of various environmental and dietary factors on characteristics of cell division. David developed an academic surgical practice in Glasgow, <coughs> focusing on surgical oncology and metabolic surgery. Since 2014, David has also provided intermittent surgical support to a mission hospital in a remote corner of Zambia. And he's written a book about that, more of that in a moment. In 2015, he was elected to be president of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow, a post which he held until December, 2018. He has been the author of numerous clinical and scientific papers and is a fellow of various international medical and surgical colleges, including the American College of Surgeons, the American College of Physicians, the Academy of Medicine of Malaysia, as well as medical and surgical colleges in both India and Sri Lanka. David is married to Christine, and he has two daughters and four grandchildren. He's also written three books in the last three years, Design Dissected, which is the title of his uh, talk tonight. He has uh, produced a book on that topic. A brief a book called Follow the Science, which I had the privilege of co-authoring with him, and also a book entitled Controlled Chaos, uh, the latter being an account of some incredible, incredible uh, surgical adventures that he had in rural Africa. In his spare time, David is a keen golfer, an avid reader of popular science, the philosophy of science and religion, and current affairs. And as I said earlier, he is the president of the <coughs> Center for Intelligent Design in the United Kingdom, and it's a delight for me to uh, introduce him this evening. His presentation, I guess, will last for around 40 minutes or so, and then there will be time for questions, although you can submit questions in the course of his presentation. So thank you once again for joining us. Stay with us for the uh, duration of the presentation and the questions, and it's my pleasure now to hand over to our president, uh, Dr. Professor David Galloway. Well, thank you, Alistair, for that very uh, generous introduction. And thanks also to those of you who've joined the live stream and uh, who've been supporting this webinar series on a more or less monthly basis for the last year or two. It's my privilege today to give the presentation. And so I've selected some material that I included in the book that Alistair mentioned, the book Design Dissected. So let me just give you a brief description of the book, uh, more as a sales pitch than anything else, and then I'll lay out the plans for the webinar uh, this evening. So this is the image that I took from the, the cover of the book. And in reality, the basic argument of the book provides a challenge to the default naturalistic idea that all of reality, and in particular, all of biology, has an entirely natural basis. And I, I've sought to take the reader through a range of scenarios from anatomy dis dissections in 16th century Europe all the way to modern neuroscience, from death in the 1800s in Vienna to the streets of Glasgow, and the life-saving influence and insights of people like Joseph Lister. And we've done uh, a few other tours into different parts of the world and different parts of scientific understanding as it's developed all the way to figuring out how 
DNA literally informs life and how some of the amazing nanomachinery within our cells swings into action. I've even included, in fact we'll refer to it today, uh, part of life's most treacherous journey. So the book pulls together an array of, of fairly digestible evidence, evidence that will show that design in life is no accident. It's not an illusion, as some famous atheist scientists try to persuade us. I want to try and demonstrate scientifically that the design is real design. So I have a few modest plans for my presentation this evening. First of all, there is this question. How can we know that life is designed? Of course, there is a default answer. And the standard accepted notion is that there are naturalistic processes that can account for all of the diversity and complexity of the living world. Now that's a significant claim and I'd like to demonstrate that it actually fails to carry the intellectual weight required of it. So, so here is my plan this evening. First of all, I'd like us to think a little about the hurdles which new scientific ideas have had to clear in order to be accepted, and there are many examples of hypotheses that turned out to be correct, but which have had to navigate treacherous or suspicious and sceptical waters in order to reach acceptance. We'll look at a couple of historical examples before considering the deficiencies and limitations of the scientific method in answering some of the more important physical and indeed metaphysical questions. We'll consider how evolutionary thinking has itself evolved and I'd like to take a look at the challenges now faced by some of these ideas and we'll see that the modern synthesis so-called even when bolstered by its suggested enhancements these days is maybe not all that it's cracked up to be. And then the second aim I have is I'd like to offer you a completely different and I think a novel twist on the concept of irreducible complexity. Many of you will be familiar with that idea. We tend to think of it in relation to molecular machinery. Uh, Michael Behe, who initially published his book back in the 90s now, uh, coined the term and I just wanted to change the horizon, get away from the molecular machines and dip into the world of clinical medicine and surgery to illustrate some new examples. And then finally, if time permits, I'd like to tackle some ideas emerging from neuroscience and briefly dip into the mind-brain controversy before seeing how these ideas actually intersect with the questions of ultimate reality. So to continue to be a confirmed card-carrying naturalist, the thesis of my book and the thesis of much of what I say today is that I'd like to propose that there's an intellectual cost that needs to be paid if you want to sustain that position. So let's get to the way in which uh, scientific ideas, new ideas gain traction. And as a starting point, I want to take you back to 19th century Vienna. This is a famous painting of the iconic Vienna State Opera House within the city centre and uh, it's portrayed there beautifully in the golden light of the late afternoon. This is the famous Vienna General Hospital, as it was. And it is an amazing institution. It was the center of the medical school back in the mid part of the 19th century. And it was famous for a number of significant medical innovations, one of which I'm going to describe in just a moment. But back in the 1830s, all was not well in what had become a notorious general hospital. An unacceptably large proportion of young mothers died following childbirth of overwhelming infection. And it was such a public concern that many prayed that they would not be admitted there to give birth. The peak death rate actually came in October of 1842 and it reached almost 30%. The interesting thing is <clears throat> that the maternity unit had two sections. We'll call them Ward 1 and Ward 2 for the sake of uh, easy reference. But Ward 1 was the area with the shocking reputation and the high mortality rate. In the other ward, Ward 2, the death rate was steady at around 3% or so, a figure that was probably considered acceptable and typical in hospitals at that time. And then in 1846, Ignaz Semmelweis, who was a Hungarian doctor, was appointed to the role of assistant physician in the Vienna General Hospital. And he was 
immediately curious about the contrasting results in the two maternity sections. He noted that the risk of maternal death for the entire hospital shot up actually initially in the year 1823. And interestingly, and he revealed this, that was the same year that some of the medical student teaching in pathology involved attendance at post-mortem examinations. And what he observed was alarming in the extreme. The policies in the two wards were similar, the only real difference being that the births were supervised by the qualified doctors in the high mortality area, they were assisted by the medical students, and in the other area where it seemed to be a much safer place to give birth, the supervision was by the midwives and midwifery pupils. And during his time there, Semmelweis observed the effect of having these staff groups change places. And it was quickly obvious that the high mortality rate was associated with the staff involved and not the location. So they decided on a very modern policy. They closed the whole section down for a while, only to find on its reopening. And with the medical students still at work, the results were as bad as ever. Semmelweis was instantly suspicious that there was something to do with these attendances in the post-mortem room. But about a year or so after his appointment, Semmelweis recorded the tragic circumstances which led to the death of one of his senior academic colleagues, pictured there on the lower right of that slide. This is Professor Jacob Kolechka. He was the academic lead for forensic medicine and, of course, frequently performed post-mortem examinations. In the course of one of these, his finger was pricked with a contaminated knife held by one of his students. And initially, and over a few days, he developed uh, initially some pain, swelling and redness, uh, first arising in his hand and then progressively moving up his arm. And before long, he developed what we would now recognise as full-blown sepsis syndrome. That's the terminology used to describe overwhelming invasive infection, blood poisoning or septicemia. And the effects can be widespread and far-reaching, involving a significant threat to just about every organ system. And for poor Kolechka, he even developed a septic focus or an abscess in one eye. And that was when the light of understanding came on for Semmelweis. He later wrote, I could see clearly that the disease from which Kolechka died was identical to that from which so many hundred maternity patients had also died. The maternity patients also had lymphangitis, peritonitis, pericarditis, pleurisy, meningitis, and, and metastases or abscesses formed in many of them. And he says, day and night I was haunted by the image of Kolechka's disease and was forced to recognize ever more decisively that the disease from which Kolechka died was identical to that from which so many maternity patients died. He then introduced the simple business of hand hygiene and used obligatory washing in chlorinated water for these students. And you'll not be surprised to learn that the mortality rate dropped to about 3%, the same as the other safer area. Now, Semmelweis became completely obsessed with this issue. He wasn't noted for his communication skills or for a gentle, tactful approach towards colleagues with whom he disagreed, and he became increasingly vindictive and antagonistic towards those who opposed him. He wrote open letters to other obstetricians, he expressed his vicious anger, he accused them of murderous indifference, and the whole episode just drove him to drink, and he became more and more mentally unstable until he was finally and tragically tricked into being admitted to a mental institution. By the time he recognised the deception, he was unable to escape. He was badly beaten by the, the guards. He was bound in a straitjacket, consigned to solitary confinement in an unlit cell. And during an altercation, it's likely that he sustained a wound to his right hand. And ironically, this became infected and he died within a couple of weeks at the age of 47 on August 13th, 1865. Now, of course, he was correct in his assessment. His scientific observations were absolutely dead on, but this was not acknowledged until many years after his death. This statue was actually placed in 1906 
more than 40 years after Semmelweis had died. And it's tragic that he died of the same condition that he had battled in obstetric service. There's an additional irony, and that is that the very day before Semmelweis died, an 11-year-old trauma patient called James Greenlees was admitted to the Royal Infirmary in Glasgow under the care of the then relatively new Professor of Surgery, Joseph Lister. James had sustained a compound fracture of his tibia and fibula. That's where the bones protrude through the skin. And in the 1860s, that was a desperate injury. In those days, an injury like that would carry something like a 50% chance of death and at least a 90% chance of the need for subsequent amputation because of gangrene in the wound. And on the slide there, you'll see that Lister's approach was to use what was known as a carbolic steam spray. He would spray uh, carbolic acid or phenol into the atmosphere of the wards. He would spray it in the operating theatres. He would spray it on surgical wounds. And he used it to treat young James Greenlees, who then made a remarkable and uncomplicated recovery, avoiding all sign of infection. And it was really quite a dramatic observation. That was just the beginning. And interestingly enough, Lister then had an opportunity to communicate, perhaps a little bit more um, wisely than Semmelweis had, as he presented his theory to the Faculty of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow on April the 17th in 1868. And the minutes of the meeting were actually handwritten, but this is a, uh, a record which is typewritten, which I've put on the screen just to let you see the kind of reception that he got. And if you look carefully at this, we won't read the whole thing, but it talks about how Mr. Lister gave a lengthened exposition of the atmospheric germ theory of putrefaction and illustrated it with uh, a demonstration of Pasteur's experiments that had been carried out in Paris. And he goes on to say that, uh, and this is the minute taker speaking here, he directed attention to the employment of carbolic acid for the destruction of the germs, look at this, presumed to exist in the air and which Mr. Lister supposed to be the exciting cause of putrefaction in wounds. I'm sure you could detect that that's not exactly a wholesome note of approval. The very use of these terms, presumed and supposed, it just smacks of the disdain and scepticism with which this was regarded. So there's nothing new here. Lots of scientific ideas, just like Semmelweis and like Lister, had run counter to the accepted consensus and had endured a pretty rough reception. Here are another two redoubtable scientists from earlier generations in the 16th and 17th century, and you'll recognize these famous names, of course, Copernicus and Kepler, who had in their time innovative theories that ran against the grain of the consensus, and they were naturally a little hesitant about going public with their data. Copernicus, mathematician and astronomer who produced a model of the universe that placed the sun rather than the earth at the centre. And he wrote his book on the revolutions of the celestial spheres. Great title. And it appeared just before he died in the year 1543. In fact, he had completed the book in 1532, 11 years before, but he hesitated to publish, not wishing, as he confessed, to risk the scorn to which he would expose himself on account of the novelty and incomprehensibility of his thesis. He was concerned about attracting scorn, but it triggered a revolution in the understanding of astronomy. And Kepler, also a mathematician and astronomer, German, best known for his laws of planetary motion, he wrote the epitome of Copernican astronomy, and he advanced the teaching of Copernicus and introduced his own orbital system. Again, controversial, again against the consensus, and it was his most influential work. And just like Copernicus, he was concerned about facing persecution and ridicule. Indeed, he did as much for his scientific ideas as he did for his Christian faith. Now, let me bring you into my world of human anatomy and the clinical realm. This is also back in that same era. And this is a painting of Andreas Vesalius. He was born in 1514 in Belgium then, of course, part of the Holy Roman Empire. He came from a family of physicians and he studied medicine initially in Paris and then because of the war that broke out, he completed his studies in Italy, in Padua, 
And when he graduated in 1537, he was immediately offered the chair of surgery and anatomy. He believed that surgery had to be grounded in anatomy. And unlike the traditional anatomy teachers of his day, he actually performed the dissections himself. And this became well known in the local area. In fact, when a Paduan judge became interested in the work of Vesalius, he made sure that the bodies of executed criminals were made available to him for dissection. Now, the default up, up until that point had been the teaching of Galen, who lived in the first and second centuries. And that had been the default system then and had been for hundreds of years. Galen was the standard authority, although his teaching was based on the anatomy, not of humans, but of various animals, including apes. And Vesalius realized that Galen was wrong. And the very same year that uh, Copernicus published, 1543, Vesalius published his groundbreaking scientific anatomical text, De Humani Corporis Fabrica, the Fabrica. And uh, this was an absolutely amazing book. Bear in mind that it was published when this individual was only 29 years of age. It was 700 pages of dense detail with something like 200 exquisite illustrations, anatomically correct, just like these ones here. These are the so-called muscle men of the Fabrica. And Vesalius also challenged the reigning paradigm in the 16th century. And it required bravery and resilience, and it attracted opposition. And Galen and his teaching was the default, but Galen was wrong, and Vesalius knew it, and he made it public. And you know, some of that default thinking, some of the default thinking now, which underpins our current understanding is, as I will demonstrate, also just as wrong. Anyway, interestingly, and I'll just finish with this little anecdote in terms of Vesalius, he left anatomy and sought a job as physician to the Holy Roman Emperor, who was Charles V of Spain. And he presented a beautiful hand-coloured copy of his Fabrica as part of his portfolio. Uh, now, the amazing thing about all of this is, and I can hardly resist giving you this little detail, um, all was not straightforward even after that for Vesalius. While he had a successful career, it's reputed that during the dissection of the corpse of a Spanish noblewoman in 1564, poor Vesalius realised at the second cut that his subject was not, in fact, dead. He left for a trip to the Holy Land shortly after that, ostensibly to escape the Inquisition, and tragically died in October of that year on the Greek island of Zakynthos during his journey home. Now, it was the 16th century, but the methods of modern science with people like Copernicus and Kepler and Galileo and Vesalius, modern science had essentially arrived. The investigation of causation and origins had gained a new momentum. And it was such a shame that even now the truth is sometimes not only not accepted, it's commonly rejected and even ridiculed, sometimes known as the Semmelweis effect. It certainly was true of Semmelweis and Copernicus and Kepler, Lister and Vesalius. And it makes one thoughtful about taking on established scientific dogma. However, that is what a scientific mindset needs to accomplish. That's exactly why scientific inquiry has been so incredibly successful and influential in shaping our world. There's no shortage of scientists who are so totally wedded to finding entirely natural explanations for life's complexity that they're even willing to sacrifice common sense in order to avoid the conclusion that real design, rather than illusory design, provides the best fit. The truth is that ideas alone, even breakthrough ideas such as the ones that we've described, rarely amount to much. They have to be communicated effectively. And there's a sense in which you know, this webinar series is attempting to do exactly that. Let's just think a little bit about the default mindset of science. This is Pigliucci who says that the basic assumption of science is that the world can be explained entirely in physical terms without recourse to godlike entities. And that's an understandable uh, point of view. But as we'll see, it puts unnecessary obstructions in the way of arriving at a full and accurate understanding of the world. Fast forward into the 20th century and we come to the writing of people like Bertrand Russell who was a very famous noted philosopher, mathematician, uh, logician, social critic, 
And he has a very interesting quote where he says that whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods. What science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. Now, Russell may have been a brilliant rhetorician and logician, but his logic deserted him when he wrote that sentence because the claim there cannot be verified by any scientific method. So by self-reference, you cannot know it. Philosophically, it's incoherent. It self-destructs. Here's another significant figure in 20th century science, Peter Medawar. He was an Oxford academic. Actually, had a very strong connection to the city in which I spent most of my career in Glasgow. He worked as a as a biologist, really, an immunologist, and he worked with a plastic surgeon called Tom Gibson in Glasgow, who was interested in skin transplantation, of course, as a plastic surgeon. And uh, Gibson and Medawar together uh, wrote a very foundational paper for the understanding of of tissue uh, transplantation immunology. He was a perceptive, at times brilliant writer with an amazing turn of phrase. Have a look at this. He said, talking of the limitations to science now, the existence of a limit to science is made clear by its inability to answer childlike elementary questions having to do with first and last things. Questions such as, how did everything begin? What are we all here for? What is the point of living? And actually, I think Medawar was absolutely right, because there are things that science just cannot explain. There's a clear limit to the kind of questions that can be answered scientifically. Let me just suggest a few things that science struggles with. So, for example, the idea of mathematical reasoning or logical reasoning. Science has to predispose, presuppose that, has to presuppose that logic works and that maths work. So to try and prove it scientifically would be like arguing in a circle. It would be a fallacious argument. The idea of metaphysical claims, some of these questions that Medawar was asking, the questions of the child about origin and meaning. Where do we come from? What are we here for? What's the meaning of life? These are in a category not open to scientific inquiry. Similarly, we're very concerned these days with, with value and with ethics and neither ethical beliefs nor statements of value can be assessed scientifically nor can the beautiful, like the good, be properly assessed because abstract and aesthetic experiences are beyond the scientific method. And if you read William Lane Craig on this, it's very interesting. He, uh, fascinating, he says that even science itself cannot be justified by the scientific method. He says that for science to be possible, there are two requirements. First, there needs to be a system of reasoning that will allow us to draw valid conclusions, so the, the logic and the maths that we referred to. And secondly, the universe needs to behave in an orderly and predictable way. So it's question begging to assume that the future will be like the past. Because the future has been like the past in the past doesn't guarantee that the future will be like the past in the future. It can't be proved by experience of the past. And to try and do that simply assumes the position that needs to be proved. So it's again arguing in a circle. It's not logical and it's not coherent. So let's get to the world of biology. Here are a couple of quotes from a famous biologist, one whose name you will instantly recognise, I'm quite sure. And he did have some things to say about design. I want to give you a couple of examples. One is this one from the blind watchmaker. Biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance. Notice the slight disdain in the terminology there. They give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. But of course, he uh, considers that design to be entirely an illusion. And then in The Devil's Chaplain, he, he wrote this, the feature of living matter that most demands an explanation is that it's almost unimaginably complicated in directions that convey a powerful illustration of deliberate design. But what you've got to remember, folks, is that it's not deliberate design. And by his way of thinking, these would be our cousins. And the entire interrelationship of the modern world is based purely on some kind of assessment of a Darwinian process. And that would be his best assessment of it. Now, the modern synthesis, and he, of course, is a great supporter of the modern synthesis of neo-Darwinism, if you like. It's the most up-to-date iteration of the Darwinian theory. 
It has many problems and limitations. In fact, these were outlined very adequately, I think, in the conference that was held in London back in 2016, in November, the New Trends in Evolutionary Biology Conference, hosted by the Royal Society that year. And all sorts of additional mechanisms are now added to try and flesh out the, the basic kind of mutation natural selection understanding, uh, to try and bring in some appreciation of the current evidence. It's worth pointing out, though, that all of these still have a kind of naturalistic or materialistic flavour. The underpinning is materialism, and I want to challenge the issues that that produces up front uh, a little later. But I think as far as the modern synthesis is concerned, I want to outline four main problems for you to think about. There are more, but these will do for our discussion today. Origin of life. Now, I'm not going to say any more about that. Uh, if you saw last month's webinar uh, run by Professor Peter Emming from Germany, a really fabulous uh, uh, treatment of that particular topic. We've also had professional paleontologist Gunter Bechley on the fossil record. I'm just going to say a little bit about that. I want to focus on, on the third problem for the modern synthesis, which I reckon is an important one, uh, yet to be properly refuted, and it's Behe's original idea of irreducible complexity. <clears throat> and then finally, and you could hardly miss this one out, the crucial issue of where on earth does biological information arise? So let's get to uh, to the first of these. Well, we'll deal with the fossil record as uh, as our first component of this. Darwin, in his book, actually referred to this. He talked about the the need to find in the fossil record insensibly uh, fine gradations. Uh, you may not be able to read that clearly on the screen, but it's in the beginning of chapter six of the Origin. But here's a paleontologist, actually a late the late David Raup, who was from Chicago. And he said very interestingly that most people assume that fossils provide important evidence in favour of the, of the Darwinian interpretation of the history of life. He said, unfortunately, this is not strictly true. Rather than gradual unfolding of life, species appear in the sequence very suddenly, show little or no change during their existence, then abruptly disappear. Now, if you imagine that there is a progression that exists within the fossil record, that almost needs a prior commitment to such a progression before you can force fit the fossils into the pathway. And again, it's an example of circular reasoning, you see. The fossil evidence doesn't demand a pathway or a series of links. You have to assume that relationship before you can build evidence for the relationship. So it's entirely circular argumentation. Now, when we think about the irreducible complexity, we're drawn to be his ideas of molecular machinery. Uh, and some of this is absolutely stunning in its detail. Uh, this is a, an image demonstrating the uh, motor protein kinesin. Uh, there's a cell biologist called Drew Berry in Australia who's taken to making amazing videos. This is not actually one of his videos that's coming up, but it is a video showing uh, the kind of things that can be done with modern animation techniques. This is the motor protein kinesin carrying its cellular cargo along one of the microtubules that it's found within the cell. And uh, this is actually an ultra-slow motion representation. These steps, these uh, steps taken by the motor protein occur about 100 or so per second. Now, some of the cellular activity, of course, is handled by simple diffusion, but some molecules do need to be dragged to the surface of the cell. And this is a good example of, of a protein that Behe argued these machines need to be assembled fully functional. They can't be built on a kind of series of step by selectable step such that each step in the pathway can demonstrate survival advantage. That is just not a tenable claim. And so while his concept of irreducible complexity has been challenged, it's never been refuted, and despite the extravagant claims that you might find on the internet. But let me give you my examples of, of irreducible complexity on a completely different scale, uh, something that hasn't really been, I think, described so adequately before. And to do that, I need to take you to Africa. Alistair mentioned the little book I wrote about my experiences in Africa, but you'll recognize this. This is the amazing Zambezi River cascading over the Victoria Falls, the smoke that thunders. 
and uh, I had the privilege of spending some time in Zambia. There's Zambia in sub-Saharan Africa. That's an outline of the of the nation, its borders. The Victoria Falls down at the southern border there, Lusaka outlined there. And the little mission hospital away in the northwestern province is called Chitokoloki. It's a very remote setting. Uh, here is a picture of me uh, taken there a few years ago. And the little baby that I just delivered by cesarean section was in fine fettle. But the poor baby's mother had suffered a profound obstetric bleed, resulting in uh, critically low blood pressure and the inability to properly supply oxygen to her brain. Now, one of the features of this was that she was unable to breastfeed her new baby, and that's a condition which is known as agalacteria. Now, if that happens in a developed country, the solution is pretty straightforward. You, uh, you provide some medication for the mother, you get to the supermarket in order to get some formula, some bottles, some sterilizing gear, and you're all set. But in Africa, there is no supermarket, there is no pharmacy. And the rather ingenious African answer is to buy the family a goat. Job done. But this for me was a chance to revisit an astonishing set of insights and look at it in a new way because this concerned the function of the uh, the pituitary gland. So let me just point that out to you. It's uh, If I can just get my pointer to work here. Here is the pituitary gland right here, hanging off the undersurface of the brain. So it is a tiny P-shaped organ which is there. And the interesting thing about this is that when the pituitary is starved of oxygen, it fails to work properly. And when it fails to work, the outcome of that is that uh, the important prolactin which it secretes is not available to stimulate uh, breast milk production. There's another view of the pituitary from the undersurface of the brain. It sits in a little bony saddle there, uh, just underneath the optic chiasm. So it really is almost inaccessible, uh, although there are ways of getting to it. But here's the astonishing insight. Prolactin is a single-chain polypeptide. It comes in several different forms, but its most active form uh, involves a chain of 198 amino acids folded into shape uh, by several disulfide bonds. And this is what it does. It basically stimulates the growth of breast tissue and it produces milk and it's synergistic with other hormones and it's controlled by these hormones released by the hypothalamus. But when you think about the pituitary gland, this is only part of the picture because the anterior pituitary is linked to the hypothalamus in a series of ways where it responds to all sorts of releasing hormones and produces a whole array of hormones. So LH, for example, stimulates the production of sex hormones by the gonads, and FSH uh, produces sperm and eggs. TSH stimulates the thyroid. Growth hormone, GH, stimulates growth and controls metabolic rate. The hormone ACTH stimulates the production of corticosteroids which is, of course, one of the, the stress response hormones. And there are a whole range of these, as you can see. And not only that, there's not just the anterior pituitary, there's also the posterior pituitary. So this is a, a real command and control center, which is incredible. And uh, what's happening here is, is an amazing system, sometimes known as the neuroendocrine system or the endocrine system. And this is just a diagram showing all the various ramifications of that system. And the whole point of this is to keep a measure of control over homeostasis or the internal environment of our physiology to keep us working uh, properly and sensibly. And the key thing about this is an elaborate negative feedback system so that when there's overproduction of any of these hormones, the stimulus can be switched off at the level of the hypothalamus. This is all done chemically, of course. Uh, chemically and neurologically, and the end result of that is that the, the whole system is regulated. Now, here is the obvious question. Actually, before I get to the obvious question, let me just say that it's not just a negative feedback system. There's also a positive feedback system. The control of labor involves the, the posterior pituitary producing oxytocin, 
So the brain stimulates it, it's carried in the circulation to the uterus, and during labour it drives the uterine contraction, pushing the baby against the cervix, and that then signals these uh, impulses to be accentuated even further. So the whole business of labour uh, spools up until the baby is actually born. So here is the whole system, at least an attempt to, to describe it. Now, the obvious question comes out when you look at all these various components. Is it really possible that a finely balanced integrated system composed of specifically shaped proteins with feedback loops and sophisticated signaling could arise in a series of small genetically driven steps, mistakes in DNA copying, such that every such selected step could demonstrate survival advantage to the organism? It just seems preposterous to suggest such a thing. So what I'd like to do for a second example is just show you one further example, and we'll try and do this fairly quickly. And this also concerns obstetric practice. So babies are slippery customers. Here's an example of one having just navigated one of life's most treacherous journeys. When a baby is born, there are three major challenges to its survival. First of all, it's freezing cold. It's been in a nice, warm, cosseted uterine environment. It comes out into the outside world. It's a risk of hypothermia. It's a risk of hypoglycemia because its nutrient supply has been switched off. But more importantly and more immediately is the risk of hypoxia. Now, in the delivery room, everyone waits for that expectant first cry to pierce the air. And it's at this point that several critical features of biological machinery have to swing into action. The alternative is that the baby doesn't survive. Now, these elements of engineering all worked out for each one of us. Otherwise, we'd not be here to reflect on the process. Now, I can't do justice to this in a few minutes, but I just want to challenge the idea that as we consider this, that this all just happened. Have that question in the back of your mind as I try and describe the circulatory changes to you. Uh, this is something which has the essential features of planning and foresight. This is irreducible complexity writ large. There's an end goal, a purpose in this whole business. And we can confidently draw that conclusion. If we can, there are a number of other things that follow really by definition. So let's get to the, the detail of this briefly. Here's an example of what the circulation looks like. Those of you with a healthcare background will instantly recognize the right and left side of the heart, the blue uh, representing the vena cava there, the big tube leading from the rest of the body back up to the heart. And in that process, it carries the relatively depleted, oxygen depleted blood back to the heart, gets to the lung fields, circulates there, picks up its oxygen load, and then carries that via the left heart all the way around to the systemic circulation. Now, a moment's thought will tell you that that elegant system cannot possibly work for a baby in the uterus. In the uterus, the oxygen supply comes from the placenta. There's the placenta on the left lower portion of that slide. And if you look carefully, and I'll try and outline the various components of this system, the blood from the placenta, rich in oxygen, gets back into the baby's circulation uh, by traversing the liver. And if you look closely there, it comes up through a structure called the ductus venosus. And then if you follow that up, it actually flows into a common channel with the vena cava. So in other words, it's mixing oxygen-rich blood with oxygen-depleted blood. Now, you would think that would be a suboptimal scenario, and that would be correct. However, the amazing thing is that the anatomical config configuration of the system allows for the two streams to be largely kept apart. So that up in the heart there, the third little circle that shows, it allows the oxygen-rich blood to stream selectively across the heart to the left side and then on to the rest of the circulation where the organs require the oxygen load to be delivered. So in other words, it's an incredibly effective and specific system. Now, following birth, what happens, of course, is that the cord is clamped, the oxygen is essentially switched off, so the baby has to breathe air. And when the baby breathes air, all these various shunts that exist have to close. I'll show you them in just a second. First, the placenta is no longer available. The midwife has clamped that. The baby needs oxygen and fast, and it needs to breathe more or less immediately. The newborn must 
transform its circulation into a system that mirrors the adult system so that the gas exchange from being in the placenta now has to take place in the lungs. The lungs inflate, the baby cries, and that whole bit of engineering requires a great sensitivity in the lungs for its mechanical receptors, stretch reflexes and so on, the sensitivity of the central and peripheral chemoreceptors to work, the chemical maturity of the lungs themselves to be adequate, the respiratory muscles to work effectively, and when you look into the heart, you see that there are various changes take place in the heart. So the foramen ovale, that first shunt, has to close. The second shunt, which diverts blood away from the lungs, also has to close. These have to happen more or less right away. Otherwise, you end up with something which is very different from this. Now, my question for you is this. Here is an integrated, balanced system, replete with feedback and control, hooking into other elements of the new end, neuroendocrine system, and it has to work right out of the box for the baby to survive. Now, I put it to you, there is no conceivable gradual step by selectable step mechanism that could deliver such a system. It seems to me impossible to avoid the conclusion that this is all the features of a deliberately designed, purpose-driven, intentional system. Naturalistic processes don't do intentionality. It's just not part of the package. So we can consider origin of life, fossil record, irreducible complexity. Before we move on to a very brief tour into neuroscience, uh, as I wind this up, let me just re-emphasize for you the information enigma, the final of my four challenges to the so-called natural uh, evolutionary process. Here's the cover of Nature from February 2001, when the human genome was first uh, sequenced, took about 13 years, cost about a billion dollars. Now you can do it in a couple of days. And here's a very nice diagram of the DNA structure. I'd love to have time to go into this in a little bit of detail, but rather than do that, I want to show you the enzymes that are involved in replicating the DNA in making sure that these pyrimidines and purines on the right-hand side of the slide there, where the, the code is essentially carried, the text is carried, this has to be replicated for cells to divide and to pass on. And there's a whole range of enzymes involved in this process. And some of them have astonishing function. Helicase is the enzyme that pulls the two strands apart. It's a very energy rich, uh, a very energy demanding process because these strands are bound tightly together. DNA polymerase uh, has to be orientated correctly in the system to, to a free hydroxyl group at one part of the sugar moiety on the end of the strand. And to do that, it then starts copying the DNA. And uh, the copy is an incredibly faithful copy. The error rate is less than one error per billion or so copied bases. And uh, this Drew Berry that I mentioned already has done a fabulous little uh, animation of DNA replication. And it shows these various enzymes here. The helicase is the blue one spinning there, pulling the strands apart. The polymerases uh, at the top and bottom there, you can see drawing out a great loop, the Okazaki fragment, which is the orientation of one of the strands. And you'll see in the close-up here, it looks almost like the robotic machinery in a Tesla factory. Now, what you've got to imagine is that all of this just happened, folks. This is not something which uh, is in any sense designed, at least not according to those naturalists who would want you to believe that. So as we move on, it seems to me that there are at least two important questions that arise here. So here's, here's the first one. There are 15 letters, and if you include the question mark, 16 characters. Now, we do not imagine for one moment when we see a message like that, that this is the result of some random or entirely naturalistic process. It's clearly the result of a designing agent. We recognize the hallmarks of intelligence right away. We don't hesitate to infer an intelligent source. But for the three billion or so letters <clears throat> of the human genome, we're rather quick to ascribe it to an accidental process for which there is no precedent, no logic, and no mechanism. So I think time for a rethink. And then I think the second question is even more demanding in some respects, and it's this. What was it that came first? Was it the protein machinery needed to decode the DNA? Or was it the DNA template required to manufacture the protein machinery? 
Little wonder that Thomas Nagel, an atheistic philosopher, wrote in his little book Mind and Cosmos the following. The evidence clearly points to intelligent causation, and Nagel said, for a long time, I found the materialist account of how we and our fellow organisms came to exist hard to believe, including the standard version of how the evolutionary process works. What's lacking to my knowledge is a credible argument that the story has a non-negligible probability of being true. Now I'm going to take just five minutes to give you a very brief tour into neuroscience and then we'll wind it up at that point. I wanted to talk a little bit about this. This is a huge issue for the naturalist mindset. The brain has more switches and more routers and connections than just about anything we can imagine. Something like 90 to 110 billion nerve cells or neurons, something like a quadrillion connections or synapses. And neuroscience has tried valiantly over the years to, to see if they can actually map particular functions to specific parts of the brain to try and understand uh, at least some kind of insight into how this whole process works. And one of the early and most dramatic cases, and I've recorded this in, in the book Design Dissected, it concerns the case of this man. This is Phineas Gage. He was a 25-year-old railroad foreman in the late 1840s, and uh, he, he suffered the most desperate injury. He, his, his job, actually, was to, was to blast away rock, and so he, he's pictured there with his tamping iron, and the tamping iron was something that you, uh, you used to pack gunpowder down into a, a pre-drilled hole in the rock, and then clay was, or sand was then packed in to, to drive the mixture down hard in order to control the explosion. And uh, for some reason, in Gage's case, the, the tamping iron blew out of the... Uh, out of the hole in the rock into which it had been placed. And the, the, the device, which is probably a six kilogram iron, was, was blown into his skull underneath his left zygoma, which is the arch of bone just on the, the side of the face. It took out an upper molar tooth that passed behind his eye. It headed upwards right through his cranial cavity and exited through the top of his skull. An absolutely horrendous injury. You would think almost certainly a fatal injury. Not only did Gage regain consciousness pretty quickly, he went on to function acceptably well. And this was one of the first clear associations between anatomy and function because the functional deficit that he did have ultimately was in the form of various personality changes. Now, another pioneer in this field is a famous neurosurgeon called Wilder Penfield. and He was famous for mapping uh, parts of the cerebral cortex to... Uh, body parts where there were motor or sensory activity going on. And so he was able to produce a picture of the cortical homunculus, so-called, which is a representation of the body with parts to scale according to the number of, of nerve endings. And it's amazing that neuroscience has been able to really advance our understanding of the functional characteristics of parts of the brain. But what about consciousness? It really struggles with an understanding of consciousness. There are all these brain and mind states that we struggle with, and we don't have time to go into this in detail right here. But one of the bewildering, truly bewildering problems is how to separate these out. Some of them clearly link to the physical world, but some of them are, rather than brain states, are actually states of mind. And this has puzzled philosophers for hundreds of years. Where does the intellect come from? Or what about desire or will? or thoughts even, ideas, memories, where do they live? It's incredibly difficult to pin these things down. And mental states are fundamentally different from brain states. Uh, no wonder people like Descartes struggled with this and came out with his famous uh, aphorism, I think, therefore, I am. Now, actually, there's a few people who have really weighed into this, and one of the important ones, I think, is C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, of course, was a a Christian apologist. Uh, he said this, if minds are wholly dependent on brains and brains on biochemistry and biochemistry in the long run and the meaningless flux of atoms, he says, I cannot understand how the thought of this mind should have any more significance than the sound of the wind in the trees. Well, an interesting thought. But lest you think it was simply because of his Christian ideals, here's Haldane, very far from a Christian theist, 
who said it seems to me immensely unlikely that mind is a mere byproduct of matter. For if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motion of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. They may be sound chemically, that doesn't make them sound logically. And so we're left with a series of endless questions. It would be good to divert into these in a little bit more detail, but they still remain. Where have we come from? What are we here from? These are questions of ultimate reality. And as I close this little presentation down, essentially I think this boils down to an issue not so much of scientific evidence, but of the mindset that we bring to interpreting that evidence. In essence, there are two approaches, either materialism on the one hand, naturalism, or theism, and they're fundamentally different. For the materialist, matter and energy is the ultimate reality. For the theist, God is the ultimate reality, and you can see that in each case, one leads to the other. They're fundamentally different in that the materialist view is random, natural, bottom-up, whereas for the theist, it's directed, designed, top-down. Now, a scientific explanation might be appealing, but as we've discovered, unfortunately, it appears to be totally inadequate. Indeed, may not even by, defini de by definition get close to understanding what's going on. And however uneasy people might feel about a theistic worldview, if you want to avoid that conclusion, here are the unsolved questions that remain. This is what the materialist thinker has to somehow accommodate, that nothing produces everything, that non-life produces life, that we get fine-tuning out of a random starting point, information out of chaos, consciousness out of unconsciousness, and reason out of incoherent neural activity. For that naturalistic chance and necessity starting point doesn't get us very far. There's no explanatory power. There's no mechanism. For the theist, I accept they may not have a mechanism, but at least he has a coherent explanation in the form of agency. The teleology is hard to avoid. Here's Haldane again. Teleology, I love this, is like a mistress to the biologist. He can't live without her, but he's unwilling to be seen with her in public. Now, for some of you, that will be too transcendental for comfort. It seems to me that we're more than just material beings. There's so much talk these days about the value of human life, about equity, about dignity and purpose. And if we're just accidents of nature, which I think I've tried to show you that we cannot be, there would be no reason to think that we have any inherent value or dignity. Life would be free of meaning. And tragically, I think some people have swallowed that rhetoric. When you think about it, if we're just accidents of nature, there's no basis for human rights or dignity or ultimate value. Yet we sense that there is purpose and value in human life. And I think that's because there is a basis in the biblical claim that we are made in the image of God. There is a sense of purpose, intentionality. And when there's intentionality, inevitably it points to real design and a real designer. So the kind of evidence emphasizing this, emphasizes that fact. And I think to quote an ancient writer, it makes us think that indeed we are fearfully and wonderfully made. This would be the Christian theist position, and it points to the reality that God sustains our every breath. It's in him we live and move and have our being. And I put to you that that's not incompatible with the evidence. So there is our question. How can we know life is designed. I think the question, when you look at the evidence, actually morphs into a statement how we can know life is designed by an inference to the best explanation. So folks, I, for me, it's not chemicals to code to consciousness, but exactly the other way around. Consciousness to code to chemicals. And with that, I'm going to stop. I've gone on for long enough and hand over to David and see if there's any points for discussion. Thank you very much. David, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, yeah, just a whole load of stuff there. I'm not quite sure where to start. Um, let me start with this as a, as a general question. You've obviously known of those things for many years, presumably since, since days when you were studying medicine. Um, 
in the studying of medicine, is any time spent discussing or considering how these things came about? Or uh, are most people just focusing on what they do, how to fix them, um, exploring the, 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 um, you know, the intricate details of them, but not, not asking that sort of bigger question as to where they come from, came from? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question, David. <clears throat> I think, to be honest with you, there wasn't much talk of the relevance of the detail of evolutionary theory within the business of understanding physiology and anatomy and, and the practice of, of medicine as we learned it. So it wasn't a huge feature. But I'll tell you this. The one thing that was very clear to me was that just about all of our teachers and I'm speaking now 40 plus years ago, of course, but I think it's probably still the case. Many people just accept it as the default position. It's assumed to be the case that some kind of evolutionary understanding applies. And so that's not necessarily challenged. And for me, it was only when you begin to scratch under the surface. And I can remember as a student, uh, I used to regularly try and get a hold of copies of Scientific American. And the thing that bothered me about the whole business was that in those days, and we're talking about the mid-70s, there were people writing, like you know, Ernst Mayer, famous evolutionary biologist, Theodosius Dobshansky, and I used to read these guys. And the interesting thing would frequently perplex me, and it was this, that the story then, of course, was all based on mutation and natural selection. But mutations were almost always damaging and almost always corrected as we were beginning to understand more and more about uh, the fidelity of DNA replication. And so I struggled to see, even with the best will in the world, and even with a generous view of the time available, how you could possibly sustain the kind of diversity and increased complexity that would be required to produce the world that we see around us. So I, I, I did kind of, if you like to use an idiomatic phrase, I, I kind of smelt a rat about the whole thing. And so since since that time, I've been interested to kind of dig around. And so perhaps unlike many of my peers, I've been more interested in this and challenged the, the consensus and really thought about it. And I think many people just kind of accept it and don't necessarily challenge it. And I think that needs to be addressed. Let me come on to a, a specific one. Uh, before I do, just remind people if they if they have a question they want me to put to um, David, then please put that in the live chat on YouTube and I will do my best to, to go through those. Um, uh, it it um, hit home a little bit because obviously if it didn't work, I wouldn't be here, was the, uh, the baby uh, example you gave and the blood and the oxygen. Um, are you aware, uh, two things, one, is that s system mirrored uh, across the animal kingdom? Uh, are, are you aware of that? And secondly, do you know of a a simpler um, system in the animal kingdom that, that the evolutionist might say uh, could stand as a as a, a precursor or a, as a uh, intermediate stage uh, uh, of evolving into what we see in the more complex system with humans, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, very pertinent point. So I think uh, there is no doubt that m that most mammals have an, an analogous system. In fact, some of the work that that has led us to an understanding of what's happening in human physiology and anatomy was carried out in, in sheep, in, a, in an animal model in sheep. And back in the 1930s, that's where the understanding of this uh, so-called Coanda effect, where you get the selective streaming and the, the directional control of blood flow and so on uh, came about. Uh, there are various other uh, systems for delivering oxygen, of course. The avian system is very different from the kind of circulatory system that we have as mammals. Uh, there are different systems, of course, for the egg. So for egg-laying animals, reptiles and birds and so on, oxygen tends to diffuse into the egg. There is no placenta there. Uh, but it's still very difficult to see. You would still need to have a huge saltational jump to get from a, even any kind of simpler system to something like this that genuinely has to work like that. And if it doesn't work out of the box, that baby is dead. And you can see this happening before your eyes. When a baby is born and doesn't breathe, and there'll be people who are watching, uh, I'm sure, who have some experience of this, uh, the baby will become cyanose, will become deep blue very quickly unless that oxygen is delivered. And so it's a huge threat. And it's an incredible testimony, I think, to the the optimization of that system that allows it to work so effectively. But I, I think it's not conceivable. I discussed this actually with one of our previous speakers, 
You remember we had Mike Denton on on one occasion, and I described this, and we talked a little bit about it just in general terms. And and he just laughed. He said, you know, the, the evidence for teleology is, is literally everywhere you look. And I've just taken a couple of examples, but there are numerous examples of this kind of degree of sophistication, signaling, feedback, balance, control. It all has to work kind of out of the box or it's not going to work at all. And, and therefore the organism doesn't survive. Now, um, on a similar point, what would your response be to the evolutionist who may say uh, this is just typical um, design theorists, creationists, um, call us what you like, who would say, look, there's this really complicated system. Uh, we don't know how it evolved, therefore it was designed. Yeah, well, this is this would be the sort of uh, the typical use of the so-called God of the gaps uh, accusation. Uh, you know, I think <clears throat> that that is an argument from from ignorance, essentially. You know, we don't understand this, therefore God did it. My attitude to that is very simple. What we understand here from a basis of knowledge, not ignorance, is that we know how this works and it cannot possibly have been formed as is envisaged by a series of step by selectable, survivable, gradual step. It's just not conceivable that that could be the case. And so to assume that there's a naturalistic explanation is exactly the same argument turned around. It is a naturalism or an evolution of the gaps because there's no explanation from the evolutionary point of view either. And this would apply to information par excellence, but it applies to any irreducibly complex system, whether it's physiological or molecular machinery or whatever it happens to be. Uh, it's clearly based on what we know, not on what we don't know. So it's not a God of the gaps uh, fallacy. Okay, now here's one to put you on the spot. Okay. Um, other questioners have said that they much enjoyed the baby example, so it obviously struck them in the same way as it did me. I know the book has many more examples in it, and you've referred to several in the talk. Um, I was going to say your best three, let's say four. If you were seeking to persuade someone and you had limited time and they said, well, give me your four best examples, what are your four best examples that you say most powerfully um, present the design argument? Okay. All right, number one, I mean, I think a drawing might be his example, probably, of molecular machinery. Take your pick, you know, whether you go for DNA polymerase or ATP synthase or any, just about any enzyme you care to mention would fit into that category. Um, I think the getting beyond to the next stage, if you like, uh, would be taking not just molecular machines, but a load of molecular machines working together in an integrated circuit type pattern. Uh, and the one I've used in the book is the complement cascade, which is a little bit like the, the uh, coagulation cascade. It's a, a series of proteins that work together as part of the immune system. And it's just staggering in its complexity and its efficiency, in fact. So that would be number two. Number three, I think I like the two that I've used specifically tonight. The endocrine system is an amazing set of balance. I mean, almost unbelievably complex system. And I think the anatomical system is the next level up again. You know, the, the notion that uh, that the design, in fact, it works. I, I didn't talk about the, the superior vena cava. It works both blood coming from the lower part of the body and the upper part of the body. It's all selectively streamed. That all has to be pre-intentioned and engineered to work that way. If it doesn't work that way, it doesn't work very well at all or maybe not at all. And you could go on and on. I mean, there are many, many uh, other examples, but uh, these would be good. And I think the, the information story is very difficult to refute. Where does that code come from? You do not get a language without a mind. And that is, I mean, I, I challenge anyone to refute that statement. Uh, and so DNA undoubtedly behaves uh, with very semantic qualities, purposeful communication qualities of a language that represents something beyond itself. And so it has all these features. It has the uh, the alphabet and it has the sentence structure and it has the control and so on. So, you know, information, I think, is is very difficult to explain away in any kind of naturalistic account. So I, th I think there's a huge weight of evidence that all points in the general direction of teleology. It all looks to me like it's intentional and it's designed. Questions come in on the on the first one, which was the, the uh, be here, if you like, irreducible complexity. Uh, the question is, 
Behe originated the concept of irreducible complexity, but Behe holds to a universal common ancestor. How does he manage this apparent contradiction? Yeah, I think uh, we've asked Mike B here about that, you know, and he, he's pretty relaxed about the whole thing. And he's prepared to accept for the sake of argument that the idea of common descent may well apply. Uh, but I think his position would be that you cannot escape the teleology. And so his notion would be that this is common design rather than, uh, than something that's entirely based on some Darwinian process. OK. Um, is that a widely held view within intelligent design community or would, would be he be a, an outlier? I don't know. I think I think probably, I mean, amongst the people that I've spoken with, uh, there would be a degree of scepticism about the adequacy of common descent, to be honest. Um, I think I think Mike be he probably holds to it. He'd better to speak for himself, of course, here. But I think he's, pre he's prepared to accept it for the sake of argument rather than just to dismiss it out of hand. But he's written extensively about it. I mean, I'd certainly commend his most recent work, which is quite thick, in fact, uh, A Mouse Trap for Darwin. It really deals with a lot of the critics that have fired various slingshots in his direction. And he shows how he's rebutted these systematically over the years. And that's certainly something that comes up in, in that volume. So it's worth a look. Okay. Um, going forward, if um, what's been discovered so far uh, and you've you've listed, you know, the, your top four examples, and I said there's several others. Um, and yet, as powerful as some of us may find those examples, and you clearly find them, um, others are remain unconvinced. In fact, they don't just remain unconvinced; they they remain staunchly opposed. Now, yeah. um, what do you think would need to be discovered, demonstrated? What uh, what would cause them to reconsider their position? Oh, I think I think <laughs> people will hold on to a position. I mean, one of the little quips I've I've given in the book I read somewhere that that actually the more highly educated people are, the more intellectual contortionist tricks they will go through in order to maintain an a priori position that they particularly favour. And so there are some people you'll never convince. Uh, it comes down to an interpretation of the evidence. We have the same scientific evidence looking at it from my perspective as someone who looks at it from a purely naturalistic perspective. But the point I was trying to make is that the intellectual cost of maintaining that naturalism is huge because there are all these unanswered questions that cannot be answered from a materialist position but can be answered from a theistic position. Now this is not some kind of claim for Christian theism. I think it doesn't get anywhere close to that. I mean that happens to be my position. That's that's the situation. But nevertheless I think the evidence is strongly supportive of that. In fact you'll be aware David that uh, one of the uh, the sort of standing lines that we took and it's on the, the Center for Intelligent Design website. I think intelligent design is an unfortunate phrase. It's become rather contaminated in the wider world. But the idea of promoting design and challenging naturalism, these are the two kind of cores. And the inevitable outcome of that is that theism is a supportable and supported position. And it looks to me as though that is the inference to the best explanation of the scientific evidence that we have available. Well, I think that... That may be a very good point to um, to draw things to a close, um, David. I'll invite Alistair uh, back in. Uh, he may have some ob observations or questions of his own. Um, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll, um, uh, someone's just got in in time before I hand it back to Alistair, so I'll read one final question, which is this. Uh, shouldn't it be stressed the materialist position is impossible rather than utterly improbable? Because the former implies it is possible despite uh, physics preventing it, thanks to billions of years. Yeah, so the, the, the description I've used in the book, and I'm not sure I used the word this evening, but I agree with that. I mean, I think it's to try and maintain and hold uh, with some intellectual credibility a materialist position in the, in the face of this evidence is not, is not possible. And, and the word I've used is actually to do that is simply preposterous. Okay. Alistair, shall I hand over to you and uh, 
let you take it from there. Thank you um, uh, from me anyway, David. And um, oh, you're welcome. Understand. Thank you very much, David. Uh, both Davids, David Guy Galloway and uh, David Williams, thank you for your work this evening. Uh, I don't have any further questions, except to say that I heard David give a lecture along these lines when he came to the end of his term as uh, uh, the, the, the president of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. And uh, I don't think I will ever forget his description that we've heard tonight of the uh, changes that occur almost instantaneously at the point of birth. I, I, I wonder at that and marvel at it. So thank you, David, for doing that all again. And uh, thank you to our audience tonight. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you for staying with us throughout the, the evening. And let me just say to you that a recording of this talk will appear on our website fairly shortly, as will all the other uh, webinars that we've had in this series. So please make use of that uh, if you want to backtrack on some of the material that we've covered. Um, we will be uh, arranging at least one more webinar and we'll notify you as soon as we have that set up. Uh, so look out for a notice from us when we have the next webinar uh, scheduled. So once again, uh, thanks to our president, David, for his uh, excellent presentation this evening. And thank you for your company uh, on this on this evening and on other evenings. Thank